Hello, this is part two of this week's Ask Home Study, where we're answering your questions. Yesterday, we answered a whole lot of questions about goats. You can check that out by checking out that video, or if I bothered to put a link up there, you can click on that link. Today, we're gonna to talk about insurance for your homestead and your animals and whether or not you should have it and where you can find it if you're looking for it. How to homestead and still be able to go on a vacation. That matters to some people. It certainly mattered to us. And also, when the baby shows up, what am I gonna do on the homestead without Kay out there every day in the barn? We'll talk about those questions and some more in today's episode of Ask Home Study. Let's dive in. This is Ask Home Study, the weekly show where we answer your questions that you've left here on our channel in the videos that we put out on our regular vlog. We do a homesteading vlog throughout the week. We show you our life and what's going on in our homestead. And inevitably, lots of you have questions about what we're doing or why we're doing these crazy things we're doing. And we try to answer those questions all weekend long with Ask Homesteading. If you want to get a question answered in Ask Homesteady, all you have to do is leave a question and then put the hashtag, all one word, Ask Homesteady in the comments section so I can find it when I sit down to answer your questions. And the first one is from a new super fan. We're gonna, well, they're not new, but they're officially a super fan. Congratulations, Whiskey Bent Farms. You've asked enough questions. You've left enough comments. I know who you are now. You're officially right up there with t Roo in the super fan status. <laughs> Sorry, t Roo. It was lonely at the top, but you know, we gotta throw some others in there. Get some, you know, it's always good to bring more, unless it's goats. Whiskey Bent Farms wants to know, you mentioned insuring your animals. What insurance do you have? As in what company? They've done some research, haven't been able to find any for the state of Mississippi. So Whiskey Bent Farms, we don't live in Mississippi. I don't know for sure if this will be an option, but I'm thinking it probably will be because they're a pretty big company. Nationwide is on your side. This is not, like, Nationwide has nothing to do with this. They did not pay me to say, they didn't pay me to sing that limerick. Unlike some football players and musicians you may know. So maybe I should try to get on that list. I'm a Brad Paisley, you know, homesteady. We're pretty much, right? Nationwide is who we used back at Squash Hollow in Connecticut. Now, I want to talk about whether or not you should even have insurance for your farm animals. I threw it out there in a video last week because we were talking about losing a high quality animal and having to replace it, but it doesn't make sense for everybody. So how do you know if, if insurance makes sense for you on your homestead or you and your farm? When we started Squash Hollow Farm as a business, there's my old sign right there. I'm gonna eventually hang this up like in the wall here. I really want to turn, I want to have a nice set for doing this so I can, you know, show off some of our old memorabilia. When we started Squash Hollow Farm, we knew we were gonna be selling meat products. We knew we were going to be getting strangers onto our farm to see the farm and tour the farm and we we're gonna have open farm days. We were very ambitious. We wanted to be the farm next door where people could come and like spend time there and buy yummy food and just enjoy that thing. Very different from what we're doing now. Now we do that kind of digitally. We let you come and see our farm every day and we let you get to know our animals through the computer. But there's way less liability. You're not gonna get trampled on by an animal right now. So <clears throat> when we did start Squash Hollow Farm, we knew we were taking on a lot of liability. People could get sick from food we sold them. They could get hurt from animals or taking a class. We did butcher classes where people had really sharp knives. And they were cutting chickens' heads off and I always worried someone was gonna be like, oh, I can't do it, no, oh, and like blood out of their wrists. And I'm a worrier. So I needed to make sure we were covered for liability. Nationwide was able to cover our property, the outbuildings, the animals, and cover us for liability all in one package. We had a really good rep come out to the farm, saw the buildings, took the notes, wheeled and dealed, got us the price of what we needed. Back in Connecticut, it was about $100 a month for 
the liability, the buildings, the animals, you know, if Ladybug had dropped dead on us, we could have filed a claim and got some money for that. A hundred bucks a year is not insignificant amount, sorry, a hundred bucks a month is not an insignificant amount of money, especially a lot of us homesteaders do this to save money. And trust me, it's hard to save money as it is, throw a hundred dollars a month on top of your regular farm expenses, and it might not make sense for you. So. That's how I looked at it. How much could I get covered? I was getting buildings covered, liability, animals, all of that for a hundred bucks a month. I was taking on lots of liability from what I was doing, so it made sense to have animals covered along with everything else. But now Whiskey Bent Farms, you are Whiskey Bent Farms, so I don't know if you sell stuff, Whiskey Bent Farms, if you sell product and you're worried about people or you have like open farm days where strangers come onto your farm, if you're already opening yourself to a lot of liability, you can get your animals covered in addition to that. The alternate route is like a pet insurance and I've looked into these in the past and I've never been impressed by what you would get for what you would give when it comes to a pet insurance. When it comes to pets and the money you spend on your pets and protecting them, I feel you'd do a lot better with the emergency fund that we talked about in last week's financial talks. A um, hundred dollars a month, if you have no other liability other than what happens to you and your family on your homestead with your animals. So basically what I'm saying is if the biggest concern of yours is you have a $500 goat or a $2,000 cow that you're afraid of dying, a hundred bucks a month is gonna to start to add up. We wound up spending $7,000 all the time we were at Squash Hollow Farm. We never once had to file a claim. So that was $7,000 that would have done really nicely in an emergency fund. Because we did have emergencies happen to us. One day our well died, and that's an emergency. And that $7,000 could have more than covered the well dying. Um, but at the time, we didn't have any emergency fund and we had to borrow money talking about you know being in debt this was back when we were in debt and we had to borrow money to fix our well so i feel that most homesteaders would do better with an emergency fund throw a hundred dollars a month in it at the end of the year you'll have a thousand twelve hundred bucks if your cow is worth two three thousand dollars you know Chances are she'll be fine and in two or three years you'll have enough in that emergency fund to kind of protect her. I actually would suggest you put more than a hundred bucks a month in your emergency fund. But you know, if all you can do is a hundred, there's your payment to insurance and it's probably gonna cover all your animal or farm emergencies after about a year or two. And as it went back at Squash Hollow, we never lost an animal that we would have filed a claim for, like pigs. Um, we were taking, with our, in addition to liability, we were taking deposits on pigs. At one year we had 12 pigs, 12 deposits. And my deposits on my pigs were about $300. So there's like $3,600 that I had that I spent on feed and grain. And let's say they all one year got sick, they all got pneumonia. Imagine if they had all died and I had already spent all that money feeding them to you know that point and caring for them and all that stuff, suddenly I have $3,000 that I have to give back to my customers. Now you see why I wanted insurance. If I'm just gonna raise two pigs for my family and one drops dead, that's a bummer, but I don't need to spend $100 a month to sleep at night to protect me from one of my pigs. Even Ladybug, who is a considerable amount of money for us, now we have an emergency fund that would cover her cost. And I, unless we start here doing what we did there, opening up our farm to the public, um, you know, selling meat to strangers. I don't mind, like, if you're going to sell your mom some meat, your mom's not going to sue you, hopefully. <laughs> Please, mom, don't sue me. I'm sorry you got sick. But your mom's probably not going to sue you. So if you're just selling to friends and family, you know, do what you want. But... If you're not opening yourself to a lot of liability, most homesteaders, I don't think it makes sense to have insurance. Definitely not like a pet insurance on your animals. You're better off with the emergency fund because it will help you for more than just your animals. When your well busts, you'll be able to fix your well and you won't have to borrow money to do it. 
And when that happens, you can whiskey bet you're a super fan now. You can say, hey, Austin, thanks. I had money to fix my well. Okay, next question. Curtis, man after my own heart, Curtis Gridwood. I love your channel. My kids and I watch every day. Hi, Curtis's kids. Hi, Curtis. In a perfect world, I would be on a property doing and learning all of this with my kids and wife. We're going to have property eventually. Curtis, I'm gonna say what I said to the dreamer last week. Don't need a perfect world to do this. You can do it. I did it. I'm not that smart. I made it happen. You can do it. That's a fact. Anything we do will be for ourselves and not for profit, at first anyways. Smart. I can tell you're a smart guy because like that's the way you should start. Just do it for yourselves and then build from there. I think a lot of people are intimidated of a farm or homestead, myself included. What I am more afraid of though is being unable to have some freedom to say camp, hunt, or go on a vacation every once in a while, within reason of course. This is why you're a man after my own heart, Curtis, because everything you just said is my favorite thing to do every day. Name that quote below, come on. I know some of you know what I'm talking about. Is there any evidence you could offer, no, sorry, advice you could offer on how you manage your homestead and personal life, like vacations and hobbies, etc.? Curtis, if you guys watch every day and you've been watching for more than like two months, you know I love to hunt. I love to hunt. Homesteading does not, I think homesteading is like, hunting should be in your pie chart of what homesteading is. Hunting should take up like a third of it. I don't know why more homesteaders don't hunt. It is such a good way to get such good meat on the table. Anyways, yes, you can definitely have hobbies like hunting and fishing. Uh, but now let's talk about specifically vacations because that is a tougher area. And uh, let's talk about a concept that I have. I have this saying, you'll hear me say it once in a while if you're hanging out with me long enough probably you won't hear me say it. I mostly say it to my wife. It's build your beach. And the saying is completely ridiculous because it doesn't make sense, but let me explain it. Build your beach. If you build your house on the beach because you love going to the beach and you love the sunshine and you love the salt in the air and you just are a beach person, right? So you build your house on the beach don't complain about the waves. So what that means is you can build your life to be whatever you want. You're in control. You and your wife, you can do it. But then don't build something that later on you're going to not enjoy or like or want. So if you build a lifestyle and you can do this, Curtis, where you and your family get to homestead together, you can do it, totally, you can do it. Don't build a life on a homestead that you and your family won't enjoy, which for you includes going on vacation. Now, this is like something, it's funny because I've seen this come up before and some people get mad at this idea that like homesteaders should ever wanna go on vacation. Like you're on your homestead, that is your perfect place. Why would you wanna go anywhere else? You shouldn't want to, or even better yet, the old time farmers are like, oh, we're gonna get comments below on this one, I know it. Farm, real farmers don't go on vacation, they gotta be there 365 every day till they die. That's why my grandfather left the dairy farm, because he wanted to go on vacation and the Navy was the only ones willing to send him to the Bahamas, so. <laughs> Some people like homesteading and everything that goes with it, and the beach. And not all of us can live on the Exumas Islands where you can see both pigs swimming on the beach. So Google that one, that's fun. Pigs swimming in the Bahamas. It's, anyways, it's not wrong to want to homestead and go on vacation once in a while. I was a surfer for decades until I kind of like settled down and I still like to surf once in a while and most homesteads are not located within walking distance to the beach. So at some point in time, I would like to go surfing again. 
it's not wrong if, if you want to go on vacation because maybe you love homesteading but you also love skiing or snowboarding or you also love surfing or you just love traveling and trying new food and seeing other countries with your children so nothing wrong with that me and Kay both love to travel and homesteading doesn't mean you can't but it does complicate things so how I have three bits of advice if you want to vacation the first one pick seasonal homesteading ventures so meat chickens meat pigs meat lambs for meat anything you're raising for meat and do feeder pigs or feeder lambs where you buy them at eight weeks or whatever the age is for lambs and then you raise them pigs at six months get a feeder pig six months later he goes off to the butcher boom he's in your freezer you have no animals to take care of my buddy john from farm marketing solutions is a master of this he every year on his farm he does meat chickens and he does pigs for meat <clears throat> he does a little bit extra with um, growing hops. I shouldn't say a little bit. He does a lot with growing hops because they have a brewery. But his animal work is done for the winter. And all winter long, he's inside working on marketing and working on his um, farm marketing solutions and all that stuff. So just pick season-specific endeavors on your homestead. Uh, garden is a good one. You can garden for half the year and then you got to be done bees you can do bees and then in the winter time they shut down and you don't have to worry about your bees throughout the winter avoid things like dairy animals uh, maybe like aquaponics where the fish are always alive and the plants are always alive now aquaponics you could easily kill off your fish and eat them all and harvest all your plants and then re get you know get your system going again basically the hard one is like dairy or if you're raising animals to breed where you have year-round animals. Not impossible, but it makes it harder. Egg-laying chickens are kind of the same thing. You're gonna have them year-round, they're gonna need care. You can still do it. We'll get to that in a second. Actually, we'll get to that right now. If you have animals year-round and you can't go on vacation with, with getting rid of all your animals, point number two, keep your homestead simple and streamlined. Use the 10-year-old rule. We talked about this in a recent video this week. A 10-year-old should be able to walk into your barn and see where the tools are, what they're for, be able to identify what feed goes in what scoop and goes to what animal. You have kids, I don't know how old they are, but if they're 10 years old-ish, and they can easily understand how everything works on your homestead, then you might be able to get a house sitter, farm sitter who can understand it. Your kids will be better because they grew up with it, but, well, your kids didn't grow up with it, but you're working on it. They will, they'll be there, okay? I'm, I'm counting on that to happen. The third, yeah, so make sure, make sure it's, oh, and automate everything. So part of streamlining and keeping it simple, automate everything you can. Feeders should have more than one day's worth of feed. Waterers should have more than one day's worth of water. If it's warm out, automatic water pumps should fill your waterers. If it's cold out, you should have heaters and not be too worried about things freezing. Make sure it's automated and simple and kind of like very easy for someone. If someone can't easily go through your morning chores, your if you have a hard time every day, your sitter is going to have a really hard time. And then when you find a house sitter or a farm sitter, uh, we always found there were two different time types of farm sitters or house sitters that worked good, homestead sitters. You want to find someone who's either like 17 to 20, but responsible. You obviously don't want them throwing a house party. Someone in that area who maybe still lives at home. And so going to watch your farm for the week is kind of exciting because they get to have their own space. You know, they get to watch Netflix at night and like maybe have a friend or two over and they're into the animals. It's not like, ugh, animals. It's something they're actually interested in. We had house sitters that loved the animals. They loved being outside. It was like a vacation for them. And then the other type of house sitter we found was good was couples, kind of like our age, who are into this sort of thing, but haven't got there yet. Curtis, if I said to you and your kids, if you live near me, hey, will you guys uh, watch the place for a week? You can stay there, do all the animals, take care of everything. 
Uh, we'll show you how to do it all. You guys will probably enjoy that. Be like, oh, that's exciting. For a week, we can get involved with all these animals. It's like a vacation. So couples, uh, and then what sweetens the pot with those couples is you tell them all the food from this week, you keep it. If you get farm fresh eggs every day, keep them. If you get more than you can handle, give them to friends. You get, uh, help yourself to whatever's in the freezer. There's farm fresh bacon, there's farm fresh ham. Like you're sweetening the pot. Farm fresh bacon, where else are they gonna get that? Awesome. Uh, when they're all done for the week, send them home with some stuff. Here, take more bacon, take more chicken. Pay them, pay them real money, dollars and cents money, because they're gonna be doing labor on your homestead. And you, even though you're already giving them meat and stuff, pay them too. Because trust me, a good house sitter, farm sitter, who is excited to do it again, is worth their weight in manure, which is black gold. So find a good house sitter who's worth as much as they weigh in cow poop and treat them good. And finally, remember, this is a big one. Your sitter is a brand new homesteader. Sitter. Home sitter, homesteader they are going to make mistakes that you will make when you first start this. So when you first start homesteading, you're gonna kill animals, you're gonna forget things, stuff's gonna go wrong. Your house farm sitter is gonna have the same thing happen. We have had animals die when we were away and someone was watching the farm. No big ones, you know, we never had like a, a goat die or a cow or a dog, but we had chickens that died and geese that died. We had a cat that ran out of the house and got hit by a car. Things are gonna happen and you, you have to understand it's not their fault because they're new at this and they're diving into a deep end. You started new and you had just chickens. They're starting new and they have this entire thing to do and stuff will go wrong and you have to tell them, first off, when you go on vacation, tell them, honestly, if something goes wrong, don't tell me to get home. I don't want to be thinking about my dead animal on vacation. Don't tell me till I get home. If an animal dies, when I get home, you can tell me. And also let them know if an animal dies, it happens on the farm. Don't feel sad if one of my chickens winds up getting attacked by something. One of our house sitters, a dog got, our own dog got out and killed one of our chickens. Wouldn't have happened if we were home, but it happened when she was there because she was new. Treat them like a farm employee. As soon as a farm gets big enough where they need to hire an employee, they do that, and that's not irresponsible. Some people are gonna be like, oh, it's irresponsible to let people take over your homestead. Well, no, that's what a big farm does. They have employees and they hire people, and guess what? The employees make mistakes and animals die because of it, and that happens on a farm. It's part of what's gonna to happen to your homestead, but if you treat your new homestead um, sitter good, you pay them good, you get them excited about this, and when something goes wrong, you don't make them feel bad, they'll stick around. We had two very reliable homestead sitters back in Connecticut, and now we're working on that here. Fortunately here, we also have some family who can help too, um, but you can totally go on vacation with a good sitter. Finally, just a couple more tips you asked about hobbies. You know, hobbies we're assuming are just like a day thing, maybe a half day hunting, fishing, you talked about. Um, so make sure your animals are good where we visit our animals twice a day at minimum, once in the morning and once in the evening. But during hunting season, sometimes that morning visit for my animals, not like a dairy animal who needs you there at eight o'clock to milk them, but like meat chickens or pigs or my dogs or whatever, they're fine if I don't show up right at eight o'clock. I leave them more food than they need. I leave them more water than they need. Everybody's good. Make sure that your infrastructure has a buffer zone so that everybody doesn't need you to show up right on time for morning chores. And again, if you wanna have hobbies and a life and vacation, avoid dairy animals. If you have them, it still can work. We have vacationed, we have moved with dairy animals. Calf sharing helped that, good planning, knowing when things were gonna be dried off or in, you know, in milk, developing a good routine that worked with our life. One of these days, Kendra will make a class on like how to have a dairy cow and a life because she's figuring it out. And it's working. We have a life and a dairy cow, so it's nice. So if you can have a life, if we can have a life and a dairy cow, you can have a life and some chickens. And I want you to have a life and some chickens. So get on that, Curtis. Make it happen. It's not that you don't need a perfect world. You just need to, you know, 
make it a goal, make it a five-year goal, make it a 10-year goal. Me and Kay, every year we sit down together, we talk about our five-year plan, our 10-year plan, our life plan, and then that year's plan. And we make it happen so we're working towards our life goal. You got a life goal and a yearly plan. The goal can change, the year plan shouldn't. So work your way there, Curtis. You, your kids, thanks for watching. Make it happen. Mary Helen is thinking forward. The baby's coming and she wants to know, when the baby comes, Aust, will you still handle everything? Will your aunt and her parents help out? Will you hire someone for the first week or two? Fun question, Mary. The baby is coming. What are we gonna do? Part of homesteading and having a life like we just talked about is looking forward and planning. We knew we were trying for baby number five. We knew baby number five would show up when Kay was not milking. Because as everybody knows, this guy don't like to milk. My homestead things are like meat animals and infrastructure. I'm not a milker, it's not what I'm into. Every day at the same time, I don't wanna to have to do anything. That's why I work for myself. That's why I have built the life. I built my beach, I like the waves, I'm a surfer. That's what I like. So, sorry Mary, I'm getting worked up about this one. But the point is, uh, we planned ahead so that no animals would be in milk because I don't really want to milk during that time. Now, eventually our goats will come into milk and the baby will still be young. But the goat milking experience is not going to be what the cow one is. The goat milking experience is like a family thing. I'm going to be involved in that. Kay will be involved in that. We want the kids to actually milk the goats too. The goats, some of them are gonna be new to milking, so they might not be good milkers. So we, we can't just like say to our eight-year-old, go milk the goats, but it's gonna be like a homeschool endeavor. It might last for a couple months until Ladybug and Kay are both back, or it might last if we love it and everyone's enjoying it, it could last a year. But it's, it's just more of a fun experience and it's gonna help cover our milk needs for a couple months while Kay and Ladybug are out of commission. So I don't have to worry about milking, so that means it's going to be warm out. There's going to be grass and pasture growing when the baby comes. The cows will be put out into pasture. They won't need a ton of attention, a ton of extra work. Wintertime, they need constant hay, constant water, constantly checked on. There's a lot more work for winter cows. Summer cows, it's like the water trough's on. They got grass. You give them hay, but our cows won't even touch the hay during the nice summer months. So there won't be a whole lot of cow work to do. All the breedings will be done, like the animals will be out. So basically what I'll be doing is moving animals out to pasture. And we try to make that as simple as possible. So yes, I will be doing everything. The only way I'm gonna get a break when the baby comes is I will take a paternity break from my work. My boss is pretty cool about paternity leave. He's gonna let me take some time off. So you know, for you viewers, count on a little time off when the baby comes from content. Other than that, will other people help here? No. Um, we try not to, when it comes to the homestead and the farm, like we mentioned about the house sitter, if someone comes here and works, we try to find someone we can pay and give lots of things to. My in-laws have been great. We did go on a vacation for our 10 year anniversary. My mother-in-law did all the chores, took care of all the animals, and we tried to make it very simple but we would prefer to find somebody younger who, like I described, like a house sitter, uh, and who we can pay. We, we like to pay people when they come and work on this farm. And um, so we would prefer, like, most of the stuff we just plan on taking care of ourselves or hiring out help. We don't really try to get our family involved too much in any of the work here because we did this to ourselves, no reason for them to be dragged down with us, unless it's an emergency or like for our 10 year anniversary going away, that was really great. Uh, it's a nice backup in emergency, but having a baby is not an emergency unless it happens way too early. <laughs> or like in the back of a van, which we've done that. I don't wanna do that again. So we're just planning on, I'll pick up all the work. I have my two oldest kids who are really great in the barn. They've become such good homestead kids. They care for their animals and they will definitely help me out in areas where Kay is currently. They can do a lot of this stuff without ever being with the larger livestock. They can fill water troughs. Summertime, a lot of things become automated. Our water lines for all our big water troughs are on a float valve. 
most of our animals are pasture fed animals now so feeding wise there's very little hay or feed needs so it really will be easier the biggest thing is going to be fencing and moving animals and that's something i'll do with my kids or by myself when it comes to working with the larger animals like ladybug i'm allergic or i've been told it's not an allergy it's a sensitivity i am sensitive you guys knew that i'm sensitive to duck eggs virginia k says i know you're allergic to eating duck eggs are you allergic to eating ducks so first off People say allergies are autoimmune, sensitivities are gut. I don't know, Virginia. I just don't want to get yelled at by all those food sensitivity people again, so I'm gonna throw that out there. I'm sensitive to duck eggs. They hurt my feelings and me tummy <laughs> real bad. But duck does not. So there's like protein or something in the egg that is not in the meat. I can eat duck all day long and I tried to do more research on this because I wanted to know why do I get stomach eggs from duck eggs and not from duck? Like what is it? And I couldn't find the answer. Turns out not a whole lot of research done about duck egg allergies. A lot of research done on chicken egg allergies. But the minute you start Googling like allergies and sensitivities, you can get down a lot of rabbit holes where people want to like make you take a blood test so they can tell you you're allergic to like water and chicken. And I, so I kind of steer clear from a lot of that stuff. All I know is when I eat duck eggs, my stomach hurts real bad. When I eat duck, my mouth is super happy and I usually have a nice glass of like red wine to go with it. And uh, once in a while, I feel like living the 90s dream and I get that duck flambéed table side. So, good taste is easy to recognize. One time, one time I had duck flambéed table side and it felt like a, well, felt like a walk back in time. That's it for today's Ask Home Study. If you like Ask Home Study, you can make sure we can always have this time to talk and answer your questions by supporting this channel, by becoming a Homesteady Pioneer, five bucks a month, you get bonus content, classes that are taught by other people, my mentors, I've like interviewed them and they've made classes for us, and a few classes that I teach myself for the things I know a thing or two about. Uh, and you also get discounts and all kinds of other stuff, so check out Homesteady Pioneer. There's some new stuff coming to the Pioneer program. I don't even wanna talk about yet because I gotta get it going, but it's gonna be good. And then, if you can't do that, become a, uh, Amsteady shopper. If you're going to shop on Amazon, type in amsteady.com first. It will forward you on to Amazon. Supporting our show, not costing you a penny extra. We really appreciate all you who are able to support us in those ways. And just those of you who watch the show, let the, the ad play here on YouTube. Any way you support us, thank you. And don't forget, tomorrow, the final for this week's Ask Homesteady comes out where we will be talking about getting water to a barn without electricity and some advice for people getting into homesteading so that they don't get in over their head. Not a big proponent of throwing kids in the deep end of a pool. I don't want to throw any of you kids in the deep end of any homesteading pools. So tune in tomorrow for that advice and I'll see you tomorrow. If you like this video and others like it, be sure to shop through our Amazon link right here when shopping on Amazon. It helps us support this channel and helps us to keep producing these videos.